standing ovation should be for this board and our hardworking educators out there who just started back. I want to thank each and every one of you for your good work, and I hope to be able, if you would allow me, Mr. Chairman, after I say a word or two, to go around and greet each individual member. Well, how, how about if we have them all come up and have a that would be even better. <laughs> Yeah. I too want to give my thanks to Greg Alcorn and Becky Taylor for your great work over the years. Uh, this is a tough job and it requires a lot of attention. So your service is greatly appreciated. And a special note of thanks to your chairman, Bill Cody. I've known Bill for a long time. And you know, I've been around the block a time or two. But Bill Covey's interest is putting the children of North Carolina first. And I'm grateful that he's given his time and, and effort to this endeavor. And I appreciate how hard you have worked and I'm grateful for the impact that you have made, the positive impact that you've made on our state. And we hope that you won't be a stranger, but we're going to continue to call on you. And I know members of this board will do so. And uh, I think we should give a hand to these three retiring board members. kids and grandkids, you know what an exciting and also sometimes fearful time that this can be. But education is on our minds, needs to be on our minds all the time, but especially now. You've got teachers thinking about supplies and uh, school administrators and parents thinking about bus routes and lesson plans and projects and taking tests and trying to wonder what teachers you're going to have and what sports and clubs that you're going to play a part in. And one of the things I think we all know is that education is greater than the sum of its parts. Education is transformative. It shapes the potential of young minds. And maybe even important, more importantly, it provides opportunities. And if, if we do it right, it provides opportunities for every child, no matter where they live, no matter what race, no matter what socioeconomic status. If we do it right, education can be opportunity for all. When I was elected to this position, education was first and foremost on my mind. And I announced a goal for our state. I wanted us to be a top 10 educated state by 2025. And when you say that, you have to have metrics. You have to measure what you're doing. And there's a lot of things that we can measure, but I thought three important areas were, number one, getting a greater percentage of kids enrolled in pre-K. We know how critical that is to the start of a kid's school career. The second, goal was to increase the number of young people who graduate from high school. And the third goal was to make sure we increase the number of people who have post high school attainment, whether it be degrees, associate degrees, four-year degrees, or credentials that matter and that can provide good paying jobs for families. 
I believe that we can reach those goals. We're working on exact numbers, but we know that if we improve these three areas, that we're going to improve education in North Carolina. In addition to the work going on on the State Board of Education, I have established a number of efforts to help us toward these goals. I put together, and I know that many of them have talked to you, I put together the Commission on Access to a Sound Basic Education in response to the continuing Leandro ruling. And this diverse group of people is coming together with outside help to make recommendations on how we meet that constitutional mandate for every single child in North Carolina, even kids who live in the poor areas of our state. I've also formed an early childhood advisory council because we know how important those early years are to the child's ability to learn. And this advisory council, I'm going to tell you in a second, the, the charge, the specific charge that I've given them. I've also established a teacher advisory committee made up of just teachers. And uh, I've attended the council, get feedback from them, and I'm grateful for these teachers who volunteer to do this. We've also continued the work of the North Carolina Business, business Committee for Education. <coughs> we know that our businesses, our employers are critical to positive attainment in education and that workplace learning, both for students and for teachers, can be important. And finally, I have revived the Education Cabinet, which is one place where all of the parts of what we need to do to get to meet. Chairman Kobe has been a part of that. Superintendent Johnson, uh, Secretary of Commerce, Tony Copeland, Secretary of Department of Health and Human Services, Andy Cohen, Margaret Spellings, President of our university system, uh, now Peter Hans, the head of our community college system, and uh, Hope Williams, who is the head of our private colleges and universities. When you put all of those people in the same room and work toward a shared goal of improving education in North Carolina and improving our workforce, I think that we can get a lot done. And I'm excited about the potential for that cabinet. I'm also grateful for staff from my office who have helped in our policy department, Jim Owen and Jeff Coltrane, who I really work with you, and my teacher advisor, Latanya Patillo help to head up our teacher advisory council and who often accompanies me to my many, many, many trips to our North Carolina public schools. It is one of the most favorite things that I do is getting to go in our schools and talk with kids, talk with educators. I think if we put kids first, we can achieve great things. Even though we may sometimes disagree on the best way to do that. I think most people would agree on one thing, that it starts with a great teacher in every classroom. We've got to figure out the way to make sure we have a great teacher in every classroom. I've told this story many times, but my mom was a public school teacher. And I saw her work hard and with her lesson plans and You'll have people coming up to me across the state and say, I want to pay you a compliment. I'll think it's about me. They'll say your mom was the best teacher I've ever had. <laughs> and, uh, I know what a good teacher can do, and I can name the teachers that had a, a, an effect on my life. In fact, when I go to an elementary school and I ask what grade the teacher teaches, I can respond in kind with my Kindergarten, Ms. Patterson, first grade, Ms. Bridget, second grade, Ms. Bradley, third grade, Ms. Bachelor, fourth grade, Ms. Pollock, fifth grade, Ms. Taylor, sixth grade, um, Ms. Jenkins. I know what a difference they made in my life. And I tell those teachers, you are making a difference in these kids' lives, and they will remember it. And what you've done 
will matter. Because I know those teachers helped me uh, to become a better person. So making sure that we have great teachers is critical. We need to, them to be prepared. We need to have high expectations of them. We need to support them. And we need to make sure that they are well compensated. Our teacher salaries are not where they need to be, particularly for veteran teachers. We have to get back to at least the national average. And I believe if we make a commitment to that and we forego tax breaks for the wealthiest and for corporations and instead invest it in teachers' salaries, we can get there. The plan is there. We also need to make sure that our teachers have professional, professional development and access to that and that they are rewarded for helping each other through this process. We have to figure out ways to attract and retain the very best. And I remember when we instituted the Teaching Fellows Program, and I remember being on the first interview team for the first crop of Teaching Fellows. And as I looked at the applications on my desk, and as I looked across the table to these young people, I said, we're getting the top of the class. We're getting the very best students who are willing to say, I'm going to give at least four years of my life to teaching at our public schools in exchange for four years of education at one of our great universities. That's the deal of a lifetime book. And we have to figure out a way, no matter what we call it, to expand scholarships for teachers to encourage them to get into this profession and make sure that we fill these high demand jobs. And we've got to make sure we have the resources for them in the classroom to give them the support they need. The, th the second thing I think we'd all agree on is a great principal in every school. You need a great principal in every school, a good teacher in every classroom, I'll show you quality education for kids. And I think a lot of the same uh, efforts should apply to our principals with compensation, with support, with professional training. You guys have worked a lot on that, and we need to do more of it to make sure that we have great principals. But great education isn't just confined to the classroom. I talk to teachers and teacher assistants and principals and counselors and school nurses and I say, all right, you got a kid coming from a situation where there may be domestic violence, a kid who may be homeless, I have two kids in school and a half for years and one kid I had would be living in a motel one night with a relative another night. There are a disturbing number of our kids who are homeless, some coming from a situation with substance use disorder in the home, violence. And I tell the teacher, you take that child from that environment and you are expected to make sure that that child is paying attention and is ready to learn and that that child succeeds. We know we need to help these educators help with these kids outside the school grounds to make sure we're successful in public education. And in line with your, the state board's whole child initiative, uh, I've instructed my Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, to work on this issue, to address family trauma, increase access to school breakfast, which we know is a critical part. A hungry child cannot learn as well. And what we're doing with breakfast on a cart and bringing it into the classroom and everybody participating and no stigma, these things are very positive in our school. And our, my wife, the first lady, she has worked tirelessly 
on these issues as well. And last week, I issued an executive order calling on the Department of Health and Human Services and the Early Childhood Advisory Council that I just mentioned to prepare an early childhood action plan to improve the health of our children and to improve the quality of early childhood education. We know that we're working hard to get the legislature to come to an agreement on expansion of Medicaid. That can be significant as we deal with health issues, and particularly with our efforts with healthy opportunities as part of Medicaid expansion. We have to realize, as this board has dictated, that we have to address the whole child in order to be successful with education. So we're going to continue to work on that. In addition to the many demands on our state in education, we've got to make sure our kids are safe in school, period. We've got to make sure that, that when a parent sends that child to school, that that child is safe. My budget proposed $130 million, not only to increase school resource officers, which I believe we need to do, and not only to provide help to make sure that school structures and the equipment they have can help keep our schools safe. It also provides funding for additional counselors and nurses. I was in one county, I won't mention the county, but one county at public school and they send home a health questionnaire every year to parents about the concerns of their child. They said for the first time this year there were more concerns from parents about mental health issues than there were physical health issues. We need to make sure that our kids have access to quality mental health care and counseling, not just for kids who may end up being dangerous and we want to stop that, but for all of our kids to make sure that they are healthy. Many of them are deal with dealing with uh, early childhood trauma, many of them dealing with these home situations that we talked about, many of them dealing with the stress of school. So in order to keep schools safe, it is a comprehensive effort. And I look forward to continuing to work with you on that. Taxpayers put a lot of money into public education, therefore we need to be accountable. Our schools need to be accountable, our teachers need to be accountable, our students need to be accountable. I think that's one of the most vexing problems that we face. How do we determine accountability? How do we assess progress without condemning? How do we make sure that the assessments we use are right for the individual child and how assessments can be used to actually improve instructions and to encourage? I think together, particularly if we get the input of our educators who are on the ground, and believe me, they all have opinions about how we do this, uh, and get opinions from the parents. I've heard lots of stories about eight-year-olds sitting for hours and hours at a time taking the test. We've got to figure out a way to be accountable and to learn, but at the same time, we've got to make sure it works. We've got to make sure that we learn from it as well. So why am I talking about all of this to, to, together. First, I want to give you my mission statement for North Carolina. And I say this three or four times a day, my staff gets tired of hearing it, but a CEO needs a mission statement and this is it. I want a North Carolina where people are better educated, where they're healthier, where they have more money in their pockets, and they have the opportunities to live a more abundant and purposeful life. That's it. I told that to a third grade class the other day, and they love the more money in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about what we need to do, we want to make 
people more prosperous. And education is a way to do that. Being healthy is a way to do that. And we have to make sure they are ready for this new workforce that is out there. One of my jobs as uh, governor of North Carolina is recruiting new businesses to our state from all over the globe, encouraging businesses here to expand, uh, working to develop and encourage small businesses, and our burgeoning and strong innovation and entrepreneur economy in this state. The number one thing across the board when I talk to people about creating jobs in our state, the question back to me is, do you have the people who can form the jobs that I create? Do you have the people with the skills, the education, and the training necessary to form these jobs? These jobs are out there. And we are in a race against innovation. I spoke at a high school class not too long ago and told those young people that over half the jobs that they'd have a chance to get haven't even been invented yet. And our education system needs to make sure we are providing critical thinking skills to them, making sure that we're working closely with our great community colleges and our universities to provide the training that they need to let people know as early as middle school that four years of college is fantastic. But there may be a better way, a better path to earning money for you and your family that would require a much less expensive associate's degree or credential. You can always go to college later on. But there are a lot of great paying jobs out there that are in the high demand fields that don't require four years of college. And that challenge of trying to provide affordable higher education continues to grow. Middle class families are often struggling with how do they pay for higher education for their children. We need to help them. I've got lots of plans regarding community colleges and free tuition and high demand fields and we've got to make sure we are ready. But when you talk about the workforce, K through 12, it's critical in making sure that we have that workforce. This board has a real leadership role. Not only that, you have a constitutional duty to provide the best possible K through 12 education for our kids. I want to partner with you. I want us to work together. It reminds me of uh, a situation that was a trauma to our country. 9-11. I was in my first year as Attorney General, Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the State, when that attack on our country occurred. Previous to that attack, uh, being a part of the law enforcement community, there were a lot of turf battles. Local law enforcement, police versus sheriffs, them versus the state, who had jurisdiction, who's responsible for cases, and then the feds, oh my goodness, uh, they come in and get on our turf and a lot of battles back and forth. When 9-11 occurred, all of us got in the room, federal, state, local. We started looking at each other. We said, our country is under attack. We can't do this by ourselves. The feds learned that local law enforcement on the ground were often the first to spot signs of potential terrorism. Local and state learned about the deep resources of federal law enforcement officials. And we started working together. And it was amazing. People could, could see the difference, could feel the difference, knew that we were all headed toward the same mission. And then that cooperation expanded beyond terrorism. It 
expanded into the fight against gangs and gang warfare and uh, illicit drugs. And now the cooperation with looking at the Isaac Center over there, the Fusion Center, where all of the various agencies are working together, things are more positive and we're getting things done. Improving education is a bipartisan thing. We need to do everything we can to put aside turf battles. We need to do everything we can to look for the good in each other's proposal. We aren't always going to agree, but we have to have a position where we can achieve consensus on the important things. Our children are depending on us. And this board can be a real difference. Already you are, but you can you can be even more of a difference maker in the years to come. I appreciate the fact that each and every one of you take time away from your busy schedules to do this job. And I hope that all of us together can make sure that our children, our children, reach their full potential. Let's get to work. Thank you very much.